Mild. I'm the executive director here at Bigelow. Welcome to new faces and old friends on a beautiful summer's evening. We're going to chill you down a bit by talking about the Arctic with uh, Dr. Ben Twining. I'm going to introduce him formally in a moment, but just a little bit of advance uh, information on next week. We're going to talk about micro and nanoplastics in the ocean. Yeah, uh, I'm not in control of it, Chris. They're, they're upstairs. It's probably me moving it a bit too much. Um, Patty Matrai is going to be telling you about the nanoplastics and uh, what they mean for the seafood that we're consuming and how changes are taking place and what science is going on to address that issue. So that's going to be the same time uh, next week as part of the Cafe Sci series. You can find out more about us on Facebook at any time or in that matter go on to the Bigelow website and you'll find out much more about some of the scientists and activities that are going on here. So now it's great pleasure to introduce Dr. Single Cell. You can see that <laughs> behind me. So I could say a lot of things about Ben. Uh, most of all, he's a great colleague. I'm going to say that right at the outset. Uh, but his PhD is in coastal oceanography from Stony Brook, which has acquitted him very well for his big expeditions in the open ocean and the Arctic. But he also has an AB in environmental science and policy public policy from Harvard. And I think that also gives a great sort of dimension into the way Ben thinks about the science that he's conducting and the role that his uh, research group plays. He, uh, he also has another accolade among scientists in Bigelow because he is working on pretty small things, these single cells, but he's pretty much using the biggest piece of instrumentation that you can to study them. And I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit about what a single one picture of the famous synchrotron, uh, which is uh, a pretty amazing piece of equipment to generate the energy necessary to understand um, uh, where these metals are located in this tiniest organisms. Now, the Arctic, as you know, is undergoing a great deal of change, and it's really important that we look at those changes, not just from the perspective of decreasing sea ice, and uh, changes perhaps in fisheries, but we understand what other parts of the geochemical cycle are going to be influenced by a changing Arctic. And uh, Ben will give us some insights to that, as well as what it's like to do research in the Arctic. So without further ado, over to you, Ben. Thank you, Graham. I'm actually not sure if I have a picture of that big instrument, but I will act it out for you. So you will, you will be all set. OK, I'm going to stand in my box here. So yeah, so thank everybody for coming this evening. Um, as Graham mentioned, I'm going to talk about melting Arctic ice. This is a topic I know something about. And uh, I'm going to draw on, actually, there's only one slide in this figure, in this talk, that I actually generated in my lab. So this is a different kind of talk for me. I'm looking forward to sort of uh, talking about other people's work and hopefully representing it well. And if I get hard questions, I'm going to refer to others to answer them. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad that Graham pointed out my Twitter handle, Dr. Single Cell. This looks like a crowd that probably does a lot of Twitter. And I only have eight Twitter followers. So <laughs> if you guys sign up, I guarantee you, you will not be overwhelmed with tweets. So it, it's, not, it's not a big, you know, you're not signing up for much. OK. Yeah, so I wanted to start by mentioning the mission. We often get asked, um, particularly when we give talks to the general public, you know, wait, wait a second, what is Bigelow Laboratory? Put it in context for us. So I thought that I'd just add one slide in the beginning before I get to the Arctic. And, and this is our mission. Our mission is to investigate the microbial drivers of ocean processes through basic and applied research, education, and enterprise. And clearly, we are a basic science research institution. We do a lot of research. We work hard at education, and that includes talks such as this to the general public, and we work hard at engaging with, with companies. So I think that's a great mission. We've, we've sort of updated it in the last strategic plan, but in this day and age with uh, the Democratic National Convention going and the Republican National Convention last week and the need for sound bites, I'm going to propose to Graham a shortened mission statement. I think we've been standing up for the little guy since 1974. <laughs> so, you know, we are really the only oceanographic institution which is dedicated to studying the plankton, the individual often invisible 
cells that make up the bottom of the food chain that make half the oxygen we breathe. And so we really are the representative, I think, uh, of the little guy out there. OK, so here's tonight's, what I'm going to talk about tonight. I've broken it into two parts. The first, I'm going to talk about really the topic that was advertised in the, in the title, the, the changing Arctic Ocean and the implications of melting sea ice. Talk a little about the Arctic, talk about ice, talk about phytoplankton. See how that goes. Then I'm going to have a break. So if you want to ask questions about that part of it, we'll uh, give you that opportunity. And then in the second half, I'm going to talk about research, which is more closely aligned with my own, which is studying micronutrients, or the trace metals that we require in small amounts and that phytoplankton require in small amounts that are critical for their functioning. And, and we're going to talk about a cruise that uh, a member of my lab went on to the North Pole about 10 months ago. Um, and I'm going to show lots of pictures and some video, and it should be, it should be a good ending. You'll have forgotten all the science by the time you get there. <laughs> OK, so let's just start. I want to just contrast the Arctic and the Antarctic. This is about the level we're going for tonight. So <clears throat> I have a five-year-old. And my five-year-old has been to the Bowdoin Arctic Museum. And he now knows that the Arctic is where polar bears live. And the Antarctic is where penguins live. And they do not mix in any way. So that's an important thing for you to know as well. Um, but there's some more important differences between these. If you look here at the Antarctic, and with this beautiful view seen from space, it's pretty obvious that this is a continent that is surrounded by water. Right? You've got a continent of land. It's covered in ice, very little exposed dirt or, or um, sediment. And you've got this huge southern ocean surrounding it. And there's currents that, that um, move around the, the continent that sort of isolate it from the climate of the rest of the world. And so Antarctica is a very isolated uh, polar region, and it's very um, far from other land sources or other, other, land, uh, other land masses. By contrast, the Arctic, of course, is an enclosed sea. It's sort of a polar Mediterranean sea where you've got sea ice. So this ice is not on top of dirt and land. It's on top of water. And it's surrounded by your continents. Here's Alaska. Here's Asia and, and Russia and northern Europe. And so you've got these, you've got shelves or shallow areas of the ocean that underlie the coasts that are important for the, for the productivity and the biogeochemistry of the ocean. And you've got this ice, which is very dynamic. It grows and, and, and um, retracts, as we'll talk about. So they're really fundamentally different systems biogeochemically and in terms of metals, which come largely from the dirt, which we'll talk a little more about, which is my interest. It's not just penguins versus polar bears. OK, so an important note tonight, um, really the foundation for this talk, is that Arctic sea ice is uh, contracting in, in aerial extent and also in thickness. And you can see this um, certainly through this figure. I took this off the website of the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Great website. You could waste a lot of time there. I wasted a lot of time on the 24th of July. I wanted to have you an updated figure here. Uh, and what this shows is as of two days ago, this, the white area is the parts of the Arctic Ocean which are covered by at least 15% of ice. Okay, so if there's 15% of the surface is ice covered, it becomes white. The uh, orange outlines are the median, so the average extent on this date over the last 30 years, roughly. So you can see that it's doesn't, you know, the extent is less in most areas, a little bit more here, than on average. And you can see that maybe more clearly, and I'm sorry for the slightly well, small font in the back, uh, but this is the average sea extent, the, where, the extent where you have 15% coverage over the months of February through June. And this is in millions of square kilometers. And you can see the gray is the average over that 30-year period. And you can't really see it, but there is sort of there's some standard deviation, some error around that. And then these are the last five years, OK? In 2016 is this light blue line here. And so you can see that we're trending. You know, All of these years have been below the long-term average pretty much throughout this period. So we've got this trend of you know, five years in a row now where we've had below, a, below average, in fact, significantly below average ice coverage. And we're on track for that as well. So there's clearly a trend of decreasing extent of Arctic ice. And you can see that another way to look at that is to look at just of the month of September. So again, data from from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. This is average September for data from 1979 to 2014, so a pretty long time period. Again, in millions of square kilometers, you can see that there's quite a bit of variation, like everything in nature. There's a lot of natural variability. 
But if you look at the trend, it's gone down really significantly. It's decreasing by about 35 to 4% per decade. And so you can see it's dropped from about 8 million square kilometers down to, say, what is that, 5 or so. So these are pretty significant declines. And these are going to have significant impacts on the organisms that live there. OK, the other thing that's changing, in addition to the extent or the coverage of the sea ice, is the thickness of it. So there's less and less of the older multi-year ice. And that's ice that tends to accumulate the micronutrients that I'm interested in. So these figures show for two different years. Uh, here's the Arctic. I should just orient you again. Here's Greenland, Canada, Alaska, Europe. And you can see the purple colors are first year ice. So this is ice that you know, melts and forms each year. And then the other colors are this older ice, including you know, four plus five year ice. And there's a great uh, cartoon of this that Patty Matry has shared with me from colleagues of hers at the Ice Center, which show how this changes over time. So here we've got the same image. Here the color scheme's a little different. The red, the warmer colors, red and yellow, are the old ice. So fourth and fifth year ice. This is for 1981. I'm going to play a, if I'm allowed to get out of my box here, play a video, or uh, just a, an animation, which is going to scroll through the years. And you can see both the, you can see the ice contracting and expanding seasonally, but you can also see over time, we're now at 1990, I know it's hard to see that, 1991, 92, 93, is that the extent of the red and the yellow is getting smaller, right? It's, be, it's definitely compressed along the Beaufort Sea, along the Canadian Arctic, but it's, it's becoming slower in, in extent. So basically the longer lived, thicker ice is becoming rarer, and that's another important impact on the Arctic. Ooh, I can stay here. OK, so what are the implications of that melting? Well, certainly the, um, one of the most obvious is the physical implication of what happens to the heat and the light from the sun. So when you have ice with snow, most of the radiation or the heat that comes from the sun is reflected. And that's what we call albedo. It's essentially the reflectivity of the ice. And 90%, we've got an albedo of 0.9, 90% of that energy is reflected back, and very little of it is absorbed. When that snow melts and you just have bare ice, and that's becoming more common with warming conditions, you might only have half of that incoming radiation reflected back, and half of it is then absorbed below that. And so that's a significantly different impact on the global heat balance because of that ice. You know, the ice of the Arctic is sort of like a little cold cap on the top of the world that is, that is affecting our heat balance, and that changes quite a bit without snow. You take the ice away altogether, and suddenly, Less than one, no, sorry, less than 10% of that light and that heat is reflected back, and 95 or 94% of it is absorbed on average. So you can see there's a really big impact on the heat budget of the Arctic when you have no ice. Okay, well, what about ecologically? This is Bigelow. We should be talking about biology. What happens to the functioning of an ice covered versus an ice free system? Well, the first way I'm going to talk about that is to show this nice cartoon which talks about it seasonally. So here we've got sort of three phases of the ecosystem. And I'll mention that this is an ecosystem that is on the coast of the, uh, of the Arctic Ocean. So later in this talk, we're going to talk about the North Pole and the middle of the Arctic, where it's very deep. But along the, um, the shelves, you here have the, the bottom. So the benthos, or the sediments, are here. And in the winter, in the dark, long winter months, uh, and fall and spring months, you basically have no phototrophic, no autotrophic activity. There's not enough light. There's thick cover of ice and snow. And so it's called what we call net heterotrophic. There's more carbon being consumed by animals than produced by plants. And there's really not much of an interaction between the ecosystem around the ice and associated with the ice and the benthic area. And then you start to have an increase in the angle of the sun. It gets a little higher in the sky. You get some warming. And you start to get enough light getting through that uh, ice and snow that the plants, the algae that are attached to the bottom of the ice, start to grow. And they can take up nutrients that are in the seawater because during the winter there was some mixing of nutrients below, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And so you get this bloom of algae under the ice. And that's before you see any activity in the water. So they're closer to the light, they, they get the sunlight first, they start to bloom, and then they become food for the animals that live there. You've got Zooplankton like copepods and krill, and they love to munch on these stringy uh, microalgae that's hanging off the bottom of the ice. So you get a very intense ice bloom, and at some point that becomes degraded. It runs out of nutrients, and it starts to fall off. And you get sort of this material 
falling off the ice, sinking down. It serves as food for the organisms that live at the bottom of the ocean. And at that, around that point, you also then actually get the melting of the ice itself. You get melt ponds, and then eventually the ice goes away. And then you get enough, enough light coming into the water to support the growth of phytoplankton in the water, in the seawater. And you get a, a regular sort of ocean phytoplankton bloom. And there again, those can sink and serve as food for this, um, for this community. And I've got to point out this word. You may not be able to see it from the back. This word is sympagic. I had never seen this word before last night at an hour that it should not be named. Uh, and a sympagic system is a system that's dominated by ice or by solid water. So you should all take that home tonight and, um, and use it in a sentence tomorrow. <laughs> OK. So this is sort of the regular system. So what happens when you have climate change? What happens when you have an increase in the duration of this ice-free period? Well, there's two cartoons here that sort of explain this. And now we're looking, instead of just over three chunks of time, we're looking over the months of the year. This is January. We have the sun sort of starting to come up in April. So April through September, we have sort of our summer. And then we have the dark months again. And you can see this is the ice cover. This is the water below. And as you get ice melting, here's our ice algae. Here's our big bloom. And we have this big, what we call autotrophic period, this big time when we're providing food to the animals and the organisms below us. And then we have this period in red, which is heterotrophic. The plants are no longer growing actively, or their activity is being exceeded by the animals. And then the ice covers again, and it, we sort of go back to sleep. So that, that's the regular system. In the future, as we have less ice, and as that ice melts earlier and forms later, we're going to have a longer time period of open water. And the question is, how will the system change? And the proposal that's um, put forth by, by these authors, and I think it has a lot of merit, is that we may not actually get more plant growth. So although this is a generally a light limited system and the plants don't grow or the algae don't grow until they get light, they need also need nutrients. And the fact that you have more, more light does not necessarily mean that you're going to get more plankton. You see this arrow is the same size as that arrow. The plankton are going to grow earlier. You're going to get an earlier bloom. And it may last a little longer. But you may not necessarily get a more intense bloom um, without more nutrients. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. But one of the implications of this is that the timing is going to be different. You can see it's shifted to earlier in the year. And that may not match up as well with the timing of the animals that consume this phytoplankton. So that's one of the, the sort of points of active study right now. OK, so let's talk about nutrients. Phytoplankton definitely need more than light. They need Mai Tais. We all need Mai Tais. Uh, but they also need nutrients. And this is a great figure that was provided to me by Patty from a colleague of hers. And it uses the analogy of this drink for the Arctic. So in this drink, you can see there's stratification, right? We have two layers. We've got the light area and the dark area. And that's caused by a couple of factors. First of all, we've got the sun that's heating the top but not the bottom. So that warms up the Tupper layer, and it reduces its density. And it also melts your ice cubes in your drink. And so that makes the upper water column or the upper drink less less salty, less dense. And these two layers, your nice, rich drink layer and your diluted, watery ice layer, don't mix very well. And so that's the same thing that happens or can happen in the, in the ocean, is that you have nutrients that are down below, either coming from sediments or coming from the degradation of organisms the previous year. And they're needed up at the surface where the phytoplankton are. And if they can't get up there, because of this stratification, then they can't support the growth of the plants, of the algae. And so as you get more ice melting, you get more stratification. And it's likely, or one of the predictions is that these nutrients will be trapped below that lower saline, that less salty surface water, um, because of the melting ice, because of this, uh, this changing system. OK, so a couple more slides about nutrients. And then we will take our break, and you can fire up your voices. So one more about macronutrients. Well, let's look at how the nutrients, or what I'm calling the macronutrients here, nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon, the nutrients that are needed in high abundance, how do they compare in the Arctic to the rest of the world? And that's what I'm trying to show you in this figure. This is a plot that shows the nitrate concentration. That's the main form of nitrogen in, in seawater. This is the global ocean. You can see South Africa, I'm sorry, Africa, South America. And this color shows the concentration of the nutrient nitrate at basically below the surface of the water, deep down where you have sort of the maximum concentration. 
So this is at about 1,000 meters in the Pacific. It, that, it gets shallower in the Arctic, but at a constant density level. And the way the ocean currents move below the surface of the ocean is what we call the thermohaline conveyor belt. It moves, starts in the upper North Atlantic, around here we are right there, and it sinks down and it moves around into the Indian and it moves over to the Pacific and then this is where the oldest water is in the deep ocean. And you can see that this is the reddest. This is the ocean, this, sorry, this is the area that has the highest nitrate concentrations because this water is about a thousand years old and as it moves over a thousand years, it's accumulating this nutrient nitrate. So you've got a lot of nitrate here in the Pacific and then that water, some of that water, squirts over the Bering Sea and over this shallow coast to get into the Arctic. Some also gets into the Arctic from the Atlantic. So what happens to those nutrients? Well, here you can see this. This is a plot. This is what we call a section. So now the y-axis is depth in the water column. And this runs from basically Antarctica all the way up north through the Pacific Ocean into the Arctic. And so this is the south, 60 degrees south, and we're going up to 60 degrees north. And the gray, if you can see that hopefully in the light, is the bottom. That's the depth of the bottom. And you can see as we get to the Bering Sea, it's very shallow. And so this very nitrate-rich water, it's the same color scale, as it moves over the Bering Sea into the Arctic, you can see it's much less red in the Arctic, right? There's a lot less nitrate as a nutrient in the Arctic. And that's partly because as these nutrients go over the Bering Sea, they support a massive amount of biology. So how many of you were here at the last last week's talk. Be honest. Good. Excellent. Yep. And so last week, Mike Lomas talked about the Bering Sea and the productivity and the ecosystem of the Bering Sea, which is right up here. And so that productive system is supported in part by the very rich Pacific Ocean water, which sits down here. And as it moves up, it supports this ecosystem. And a lot of those nutrients are either taken out or they sink to the bottom. And when they come to the bottom, they can be converted back to a form of, of night of, nit uh, of nitrate, which is unavailable through a process called denitrification. And that's more chemistry than we're going to get into tonight, but you lose that nitrate. And so when you get into the Arctic, you have less nitrate to work with. So last slide on nutrients. So how does this vary around different regions of the Arctic? This bar graph shows the concentration of nitrate, that's NO3, at the surface. So now we're looking just at the surface at the end of the winter, when it's at its maximum, before the plants have started to grow and have drawn it down. And these are different areas, and they go from the Pacific sector to the Atlantic sector, and then this is the part in the middle, the interior. And you can see that in the Pacific sector, there's a, it's pretty rich. There's a lot of nutrients there. There's less in the Atlantic sector of the Arctic Sea because the source waters of the Arctic, excuse me, of the Atlantic are less rich. But you can also see that there's very low nutrients in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. And so the point to take away from this and the last slide is that the Arctic Ocean in general is sort of nutrient poor. There's not a lot of nitrate there to support the growth of phytoplankton. And therefore, as ice melts and as you get more light, there's going to be this interplay and this other control that's going to come up, which is nitrate availability. And people like Patty and Matry here are working very active, actively on that. Um, but that's something that you sort of keep in mind as we think about the impacts of the melting Arctic. So with that, I'm going to show you this amazing picture that I found on the internet and take any questions that you have sort of about that part of it before I start talking about metals. So any questions? Yes. Uh, what do I mean by the thousand year old water? Good question. I probably moved to that a little quickly. So what I meant, and I'll start to say it again, is that there's sort of, we think of the ocean sometimes as having two layers. We have sort of the surface ocean that's, con that's influenced by the winds and the currents that are dr driven by the winds. And then you've got the deep ocean, which is sort of isolated from the wind. And in that part of the ocean, the circulation is controlled actually by the density of the water. And what happens is that the water basically becomes very dense at the surface here off the Atlantic uh, Arctic interface. And it sinks down to the bottom of the ocean and it moves. It just pushes itself around. And it takes about a thousand years for that to happen. So the water that starts in the Arctic, it actually comes up in some other places. There's, I'm simplifying it a little bit, but um, it basically moves around. And so this is much older deep water than over in the Atlantic. And what I was trying to point out is that this water is the source of nutrients for the Arctic in the Pacific sector. And this water is the source of the nutrients for the Atlantic sector. And they're different. So 
very fine point, but sort of interesting, I hope. Any other questions? Yes. Good question. Is that will the increase in global sea level increase mixing at all? I think probably the answer to that is no. I mean, I think as sea level rises, everything's going to go up um, a small amount relative to the depth of the ocean, which is very deep. Um, and in fact, the thought is that as you have more warming, not only are you going to have lower, sa salting, uh, lower saline waters, but you're also going to have warmer waters. And so you're likely to have more stratification and less mixing over the global ocean as we get more warmth in the upper ocean layer. Yes. I remember reading years and years ago about the report covered in Columbia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're asking about, so the question I think was that you've heard reports about the Arctic ice sheet breaking up sort of rapidly, like on the course of a, over a year and influencing climate strongly. So then I'll defer, well, I'll ask Patty if, I've, if this is right, but you know, I, I think that's probably, in, you're sure that's not in reference to the Southern Ocean or, or, yeah, okay. yep. Albedo effect, yep. And also the salinity affects, the salinity of that water affects the sinking of it quite strongly. But Patty, do you have a, I, don't, I want to defer to the expert in the room here. Do you want, would you like to bend or would you like to do it at the end? You can. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I, well, I can. Yeah. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Patty Matry. Speaking next week on microplastics. <laughs> so quickly, got to get to my video. Uh, no, by definition, we don't really have ice sheets right. in the Arctic, other than around Greenland. We talk about ice sheets as what they comes out of the glacier around the Southern Ocean. What we do have in the Arctic is sea ice cover. It's all sea ice. It, it is now thinner than it used to be. So if I heard the question correctly, is whether it's breaking up? Whether it's, whether it's possible that, that basically that the Arctic ice could sort of break up within a year and affect global climate significantly? That's well, the question. What, what um, the sea ice in the Arctic does, it melts. It thins and then it melts effectively. And so what's happening now, and I was just looking at pictures for another reason uh, this afternoon at buoys that we have. We have less and less uh, multi-year ice as uh, Ben showed at the beginning. And so, but we do have formation of sea ice still every fall and winter, but it's significantly thinner. That means that every year we have more open water. And at the end, then that ice breaks faster because it's thinner. It's very different than the breakup of the ice sheets in the Southern Ocean, where they extend from the glaciers from land over the ocean, and then it comes, they were melted from underneath, and then at some point they break. So can you, could we have a no sea ice Arctic at some point in the future? Yes, and sadly a lot faster than any of us thought. But probably not within a year. I mean, I think that no, that scenario is yeah, not no, really consistent with this. The yeah. The question, for example, this year, which has been very warm, will this year the sea ice retreat or melt exceed the lowest one on record, which is 2012 at this point? Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to keep us going just for the sake. I'm happy to talk more efforts, but I want to get you guys out by 9:30, as promised. So <laughs> we're just going to keep going. Okay. So what about micronutrients? Something I know a little more about. So I have a five-year-old son. My five-year-old son insists that fruity pebbles are extremely healthy. And so 
to, uh, I'm going to use this as an example of why micronutrients are important. So if you look at the nutritional label of Fruity Pebbles, sorry, of Fruity, yes, Fruity Pebbles, they will show you that for one serving of Fruity Pebbles, in addition to 10% of your saturated fat per day, they also provide some micronutrients that you need. So you get 20% of your daily iron intake, you get 20% of your zinc, required zinc intake, copper, and you also get B12, which is a cobalt-containing molecule. So by eating even fruity pebbles, you can get these metals that we require for many functions in our, in our bodies. And my son would point out that actually if you serve eight, five servings of this, you would get 100% of your needed iron <laughs> and 50% of your daily fat. So my point is that phytoplankton need these micronutrients as well. And this is a, my uh, very exciting green circle, which is a phytoplankton cell. And I just want to point out some of the functions that they need metals for. So iron, which is abbreviated as FE, if you go back to your high school chemistry periodic table, iron is needed largely for photosynthesis. So in order for plants to make chlorophyll and to capture light energy and turn it into organic matter and energy, they need iron. And that's really the biggest use of iron in cells. And they need other elements as well. I won't go through them in the interest of time, but they need cobalt and zinc and copper. And they use them for a host of processes just like we do. So, so phytoplankton need iron is the point. And it turns out that most of the iron gets into the ocean, at least the non-Arctic ocean, through dust. And you can see this through this model, which is again of the global ocean, and this is produced by NASA. And what it does is it's showing these plumes of dust that are bringing iron to the ocean. There's, these are color-coded. So orange is basically lithogenic material or crustal material, basically dust. And you can see it blowing off the Sahara into the Atlantic Ocean and fertilizing the Atlantic. You can see that the southern hemisphere just doesn't have an equivalent source of iron. And so much of the waters around Antarctica and in the southern hemisphere are iron limited. They have more nitrate than you'd expect. And if you add iron, things grow. If you look at the Arctic, to get back to the Arctic, you see there actually isn't much data there. The, the models are a little light on predictions for the Arctic. And so that's one of the, the things that we've been trying to address with the, with the crews I'm going to talk about. What happens in the Arctic? Is there dust up there and is it supplying iron? So what is the implication or what is the impact of that iron not coming into the ocean evenly over the whole globe? Well, this is a summary, color coded, again, of showing the global ocean. And the underlying color, which is green down here and blue and then green up here, is the concentration of phosphate. So that's another nutrient, macronutrient. You can think of it sort of like nitrate, pretty much equivalent. In your, and it accumulates down here around Antarctica because there's not enough iron. And the, the, each of these dots is an experiment that someone did on a ship where they added nutrients, they added metals to the water, and, to, and they saw what responded, what grew to that in response to that. And where it's red, it shows that it's iron. These are all the places of the globe that are iron limited. And you can see that it's much of the southern hemisphere and around Antarctica. It's much of the Pacific. You don't see much in the Atlantic. This is all green, which is nitrogen. Nitrogen limits the Atlantic. And then you have some suggestion that there might be some in the North Atlantic, but there's no data for the Arctic. People haven't done this experiment. Actually, there's one example that I'm going to show you in the next slide that happened after 2013. But there's been very little effort to assess whether iron could be a limiting nutrient in the Arctic. And so that's one of the driving questions that we've tried to address with the research I'm going to, the, the crews I'm going to talk about here. There's one more thing that I want to talk about, which is that iron, well, I want to talk about a lot more things, but one more thing I want to talk about here, which is the interaction of iron and light. So we've talked a lot about how light is really important in the Arctic, right? Arctic has a lot of ice, light limited. Well, phytoplankton need iron to make chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is like, you can think of it as like their radar dish for collecting light, right? This is how they're collecting light energy and turning it into, into chemical energy. So if you have a cell, this is my very interesting cell. Again, it's a circle. And the chlorophyll or the, the pigments are shown in these little gray circles. And so that's how they take the light, which is the arrow, and turn it into energy, which is an electron. So if this cell is light limited and iron limited, if you give it more iron, it will make more chlorophyll. And therefore, it can use light more readily. It has basically bigger antenna to collect the light. Or you can give this cell more light, and it can actually collect more light with its single chloroplast or its single antenna. Or you can give it both, and it will be even happier. So there's an interaction between iron and light in that cells that have very low light require more iron. 
And that's another reason why we think that iron could be interesting or important in the Arctic because it's a really low light environment. And therefore, the iron requirements may be higher than they are in other regions. And I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. And that's sort of exactly what we see in the one study that has gone out and actually looked for iron limitation. This is a map of this is uh, Alaska right here. This is Alaska, there's Barrow. This is the Beaufort Sea, so this is Canada. This is the Arctic Ocean. And this was a study done right at this station. And these are profiles. This is the profile of light. So this is depth here. You can see the light goes away as the dashed line. And this dotted line right here is fluorescence. That's plant material. Okay, so you can see that all the plants are hanging out down here. It turns out that's about 50 meters, 150 feet down. So they're all hanging out down here, or much of the chlorophyll is. And this is the dissolved iron concentration. So this is the iron that's the nutrient. And you can see that it's actually drawn down significantly at this depth where all the plants are. So this is suggestive that you'd have very, this is actually, these are concentrations that could limit the growth of phytoplankton. And this is what they wanted to look for. And so they took water at this depth that had very low iron and they incubated it over eight days, over a week. And this is the concentration of plant material. And what they saw is when they added iron, they saw more growth. And that was true um, compared to a control that, and also to a control to which they had added nitrate. And so there was a strong nitrate effect and there was an even stronger nitrate plus iron effect. So this is suggestive information that, that iron could play playing a role here. Okay, so now I'm gonna move to the final section of the talk, which is about this cruise that we did in the past year. And I actually have almost no data from this cruise, so you've made it through all the figures. Now we're gonna show movies and, and pictures and I might do a little dance. So, the, the project that we were part of is called the Geotraces program. And so this is a program, it's an international program. It's involved 35 countries over the last decade or so. It was launched about in 2005 after a couple years of planning. And the mission of Geotraces, unlike the mission of Bigelow, is to identify the processes and the fluxes that control the distributions of trace elements or micronutrients like iron in the ocean and to establish the sensitivity of these distributions to changing environmental conditions. So clearly the Arctic Ocean is a really good place to go to try to understand how iron distribution is changing with melting sea ice. So the way that the Geotraces program works is that groups of scientists in individual countries put together proposals to do cruises across whole ocean sections. And the goal is that if people in each of these 35 countries go across and do bits of the entire global ocean and each of these lines is a cruise that has either already happened or is planned to occur based on color yellow and black have already happened and red is planned. And that if we all do this, that we can take all of this data and put it together and get a global understanding of how iron and other metals move through the oceans. So my own group here at Bigelow has participated in a cruise across the Atlantic six years ago and we've gone on a cruise through the India, excuse me, the Pacific Ocean and the cruise that I'm going to talk about now get from, the, from Alaska up to the North Pole and back. And this was our contribution to the Geotraces program. And what you get when you put together all that data is beautiful images of, let's see if I can do this, of nutrients in the water. So this is a image. These are each data from these cruises that have gone across. The, this is the Atlantic Ocean. This is South America. This is Africa. And you can see that you can put these together to, put it, to sort of put together pieces of the puzzle. And if I can stop this in just the right spot, we've probably already missed it. But here's now, yeah, now you're upside down. So here's Africa, here's the north. And you can see, for example, that in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's this big hot spot of iron. This concentration, this color scheme is iron. And you can see that there's a lot of iron, and that's coming out of hydrothermal vents that are at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Something else you might see is that there's a lot of iron coming off of Africa. And it turns out that Africa has a lot of water that comes up from the deep ocean. It supports a lot of fisheries and, and biological activity. And then it sinks. And then that iron is then remineralized under low oxygen conditions. And then this last thing I want to point out, it's sort of hard to see in this angle, is this iron at the surface. And that's coming, that's the dust coming in from Africa. So I showed you that picture of all the dust coming from the Sahara. And this is that dust coming over from Africa and landing here. So you can use these sections to understand a lot about how the oceans work. So this is the goal for the Arctic. Okay, well, what, are so, what sources of iron could there be in the Arctic? Well, one of the sources that we may find is actually the ice itself. 
So as Patty mentioned, you have multi-year ice. You have ice that's accumulated dust over multiple years. You also have ice that forms on the shelves where you have, where it might be actually in, in contact with dirt. And you have places where it might be in contact with river water that's coming in that has a lot of dirt in the river water. And in all those places, it can pick up dust and dirt. And you can see these pictures from the cruise we were on of sort of this dirty ice. It's very simple. It's just got ice with dirt in it. Oh, I don't need to move. And we're going to skip that. OK, but I want to show this, because this is the data of Spencer Apollonio sitting in the second row here. Spencer sent me a letter this week knowing that I was talking about this. And he said, I've been working on iron in the Arctic. And I read this paper, which I had not seen before. So thank you, Spencer. And what Spencer did is he went out and he wanted to see if iron or other compounds that come from the ice could be assisting in the growth of phytoplankton, just like nutrients do. And so what they did is they looked at the assimilation of carbon. So this is sort of the rate of plant growth over time. This is days of the year. And what they did down here is they actually added either iron and other trace metals. And they looked at the comparison to a control that didn't have that. Or they added a compound called EDTA, which is a compound which binds iron. It sticks to iron, and it makes it more available for phytoplankton. And you can see that in a couple of instances, when they added these compounds, it actually made things grow more. And this is suggestive that iron, again, may be playing a role in the Arctic Ocean. So there's a lot of suggestive data. And what we wanted to do is go and make some really conclusive measurements. So this is the cruise track. This happened in last fall, August to October. We chose that time period because that is the minimum ice extent. We've seen those pictures, right? September is when you have the least amount of ice, which makes it the easiest to get to the North Pole. The cruise left out of Dutch Harbor down here, and it went up into the Chukchi Sea here, and then up to the North Pole and back. And I'm actually going to show a video, which was a couple minutes long, but it's nicely produced. It has some dramatic music to wake you up for the last section of pictures. And we'll see if I can get this to work. Let's see. This is loud enough here. All right. This is a, this is produced by the chief scientist of the cruise. You should be inspired at this point. So Dutch Harbor is a, is a port that you have to get to by plane. So there's the ship, the Healy. I'm not very tactical. I'm the associate director and professor of the Applied Research Center at FIU. I'll be leading a, a group of 51 scientists aboard the US Coast Guard cutter Healy to characterize the geography. So 51 scientists, big ship, more than 400 feet long. To give you a sense of what a, a major oceanographic cruise is like in terms of mobilization, lots of carrying of equipment, lots of unpacking and setting up. Most of the equipment on this cruise was actually loaded in Seattle several months before the cruise. And then the scientists met the cruise in Dutch Harbor and had to set everything up. So one thing we do as trace metal chemists is we put plastic around everything. So you go into the ship and you coat everything in plastic. You make rooms with plastic, and then you supply them with clean, filtered air. It's a rosette that you use to collect seawater samples.
So there are more than 1,000 samples collected over that cruise, just each then multiplied by 10 or 15 things we measure. Ready to go. And I'll, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll see them sail away. has never become a meme for me. It is one of those uh, unique mission sets that every day we see something different. And we're going to be on the way for 62 days. It always remains novel, unique, and we stay on top of our game at all times. The artist is a very forbidding, extreme environment. It's very difficult to go there to get data to understand how it works. We're hoping that as we leave Dutch Harbor, that we'll be able to contribute to our lock and closing secrets so we can try to understand how the Arctic will change in the coming decade. Great. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of sort of the ship. It's a massive ship, um, much bigger crew than you find on, a, on an academic research vessel because it's a Coast Guard vessel, so they do a lot of training there. So there were 50 scientists. And there are more than, I think, um, close to 100 uh, crew members as well. So from a science perspective, it's a very different kind of experience to be a scientist there. OK, so now I've just got to mostly ending with a lot of pictures of sort of give you a flavor of what this cruise was like. And I actually wasn't on this cruise. I sent my technician, Sarah Rauschenberg. I'm very lucky to have Sarah to send all around the world. Um, if I didn't, I wouldn't have my wife. And so it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good trade. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do was, of course, to sample this ice. And in particular, in this case, we were trying to sample ice that was dirty, that had uh, ice that had dirt um, associated with it. And we were also trying to collect ice that had the ice algae on the bottom of it. So I showed you some cartoons of that ice algae. What we found on this cruise, not surprisingly given when we went, was that there wasn't much ice algae. If you recall those cartoons, it comes early in the season, it falls off and then it's replaced by the algae below it in the ocean. But we still really wanted to sample it. This was our opportunity to be up there. And so these folks got lowered down from the crane onto this ice flow, and they're using a very clean plastic bucket from Ace Hardware Store to try to collect that ice. Oh, I'll stay back here. This is some of the extent that we went to to collect clean samples from the ice itself without contaminating it. I mentioned that iron can be sort of a very contamination prone element. So here we are, or here's a scientist, dressed entirely in a Tyvek suit with a hood. They have a Teflon shovel, not something you can buy at Ace Hardware Store. And she's actually shoving sample, shoveling samples of snow to collect for analysis. Once they've cleared the ice, they can then drill into the ice. This is a Teflon and titanium drill, which is far more expensive than you'd like it to be. But the goal is to drill into the ice about a four inch diameter core so that you can get that sample, again, without contaminating it with you know, any, any oil, any rust from a steel shaft or anything like that. Um, and so they use lots of specialized equipment. Once you've got your core, here's an ice core. It's bagged up. Everything goes into a plastic bag on the cruise. So walking back with, to the ship with the, with the prey, the ice samples. And this is what we then do with the ice core. This is in a plastic sort of room. So we've lined everything with plastic to try to keep it from being contaminated. We have these plastic clean trays that they go in and then we split it out and different sections or different depths of the ice core go to different people um, in order to analyze for different things. And what I like it's worth showing here is that actually if you can see this, this is supposed to be the ice algae rich section of the core. <laughs> you can see it's very clear, very pristine ice. And so um, as I said, there was very little ice algae there. But we were able to find some. Here's some algae in our, in our um, these are about the size of, uh, this are about two quarters in diameter to give you a sense of scale. And this is some of the algae that we collected from the bottom of the ice. And what we in particular did in my lab, Graham mentioned the work that I do, we take these cells and we actually look at them. This is on the, on the ship, this is Sarah looking under our microscope. And these are diatoms that are the ice algae that stick to the bottom of the ice. They're called Melosyra. 
And what we do is we identify these individual cells, these single cells, and we then take them to a synchrotron uh, out of side of Chicago, which is a huge accelerator, a kilometer in circumference, and we make images of the elements in these cells. So these are element maps of these cells. You can see they have the similar shape. And you see we can get maps of silicon and phosphorus and sulfur. These are these macronutrients. And also elements like iron and copper and zinc. And it looks like there's very little iron in here, but actually it's because there's these single pixels that represent pieces of dirt that are attached to the side of it. And so we can remove those and analyze the elements in the cell. So I mentioned that this was a historic visit to the North Pole. This was the first time a US surface ship had reached the North Pole unaccompanied in history. So there have been, uh, there have been nuclear submarines that have made it to the North Pole unaccompanied, uh, but there have been no surface ships. And so it was quite a celebration when we got to the North Pole. Here's the whole crew at the North Pole. There was sort of quite a bit of pomp and circumstance. You can see they immediately erected Santa's pole. Well, actually, I assume it was already there. Uh, so that was there. We put the flag. There was a bit of a ceremony at the North Pole. Uh, these are some of the scientists and crew members on the ship sort of receiving the official documents from uh, the captain having reached the North Pole. And of course, you get to meet Santa, right? I mean, if you're going to come all this way. So here's Sarah hanging out with Santa at the North Pole. And I want to end just to show, you know, get you in the spirit here on July 26th. Some of the other thing we do, we have a little bit of thematic music at the North Pole. <laughs> I haven't been able to get this out of my, my head all day. So it couldn't have been that cold. I mean, he's not even wearing a hat. So some science fun. So that's it about the cruise and the project. I want to end, if I can get to the next slide, with just making a connection between this research and the research at Bigelow and our new Center for Venture Research on the Arctic Ocean. This is headed up by Chris Epley, who's going to be talking about his own Arctic research later in the summer in August. And these Centers for Venture Research, or CVRs, are a, an, um, an attempt by Bigelow to connect both societal needs with the signs that we and others produce uh, and the support for those by governments or foundations or other individuals who want to enable those connections to make place. And so this is something we've started about seven months ago. We're working on solutions that are really science-based to inform policy and public awareness. And you know, we've had a theme of Arctic research this, this, um, this summer as part of the CAFE scientific series. And this is sort of one of the reasons to advertise that. And so with that, I will finish. I want to just acknowledge Patty, who's helped a lot um, with some of my own background, Spencer for providing some, some of his data, Sarah Rauschenberg, who is the technician who went on my cruise, and Peter Morton, who's my collaborator, Bill Schmoker, who's an um, elementary school teacher who ran a blog and took many of the pictures that I've shown here um, through the Polar Trek program and the entire team. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any question? I know it went a little long, but you have had one question period already. Yes? So when will you be able to say something about the implications of it for the society we live in? How it could be used uh, based on the basic research? Right. So the question is when will we be able to use this inform or have this information in hand to make some sort of societally relevant and, and what kind of implications could we have? Yeah. And what kind of implications? So the data from our crews will probably be coming out over the next year. We've now analyzed about a third of our samples. Um, it's a three-year project, and we're about half of way into it. So probably in about a year and a half or two years from now, we will sort of convene this group to try to pull together some synthetic observations. And the hope is that pretty much immediately in the next year or so, those would come out. And they, certainly my own work, I've focused on iron as a nutrient. Um, and so we will be putting those, we'll be talking to modelers about how that will be impacting our future predictions of Arctic productivity. But the other thing, other, some of the other elements that have been measured are lead and mercury. And these are both elements of concern as pollutants. And particularly mercury tends to accumulate in organisms in the Arctic. And so other colleagues on the crews were measuring mercury. And they will also be bringing those measurements out. They'll be working with some of the native communities up there 
to understand mercury levels in the, um, in the mammals that they're eating and that are you know, forming some of their subsistence foods um, and helping to also reform our understanding of mercury cycling in the world. So yeah, I think the answer is, a, is sort of a year or two. And I think that it will impact not only sort of predictions of productivity, but also pollutant transfer um, in the Arctic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what is the chance that climate change will get ahead of the value of our data? Uh, well, climate change is already happening, right? So, um, and it's been happening for a while. I think that our data are certainly a snapshot. Um, they are not at the beginning. They're not at the end. You know, the beginning happened, you know, pre-industrial is probably when we think, you know, before humans impacted the environment. Uh, but I think that this data will be, it will be a valuable baseline. We don't know where on the trend it will be. We, you know, it's not the beginning of the trend, but it will certainly serve as a baseline or as a waypoint, no matter where things change relative to that. So, um, you know, science is not a, a really fast endeavor. That's a fair comment. Um, this, this cruise took a long time to plan, huge resources from the gov federal government to make it happen. Um, but I think it will certainly be timely. I mean, it's ice-free Arctic is not coming next year, hopefully. It's probably, you know, a couple decades away still. And so I think, I think it will be useful, certainly. But, you know, science needs to move fast. You're right. It has to move at the speed of, of our own climate. Definitely. Yes, in the front. Have you seen any difference in the amount of iron at the magnetic north pole mm. versus the geographic north pole? So the question is, is there, do we see any difference in iron from the magnetic pole to the geographic north pole? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> um, I think that the iron that's dissolved in seawater is of such, you know, that's such a minor, the, the forces that are acting upon it are so much stronger than the gravitational force um, of iron. It's also not necessarily the magnetic form of iron. So we don't see that controlling the distribution. Things like the currents and proximity to rivers and sediments are much stronger controls on that. But it's an interesting question. You might see it in the magnetotactic bacteria that live at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Any more? Yes, up front here. Yeah, so the question is why were, um, would mercury concentrations be higher in the Arctic? And that's good. I, I felt like I should have talked more about mercury, but that data is not my own and it's not published and we're live streaming this to get me more Twitter followers. So, um, <laughs> but mercury, um, mercury tends to form a methylated form of methylmercury and that tends to accumulate within fats, in fatty tissues. And so organisms in the Arctic that are very fat rich tend to um, be prone to accumulating that mercury. Um, and that's sort of, I think, one of the large, largest reasons why you tend to have a lot of mercury. There's also mercury can be transported um, through the atmosphere. Mercury forms a gas naturally. And so it can also be sort of transported through atmospheric processes and sort of distilled in the Arctic. And then it comes down in the Arctic and it tends to stay there because of a lot of the fatty organisms. So um, yeah, mercury levels are higher there than you might find, for example, in the Gulf of Maine, um, partly because the organisms are different and because of where it is in the Earth. So good question. There's mercury is definitely of concern there. Yep, in the back. As the uh, Arctic melts and the water becomes, the salinity changes, how will that affect the ocean currents? Mm. And things like dust from the Sahara will that, those changes affect where that material will go? Yeah. So the question was, as this ice melts and as you get this salinity, lower salinity waters, how will that change currents? essentially. And will, will it have any implication, for example, for this Arctic dust coming off? So the Arctic dust is driven by, you know, the jet stream and high level atmospheric um, wind currents. And that definitely moves around as a function of time and, as, and of weather. Um, it has a seasonality to it. But I think it's unlikely that that's going to move or be impacted, you know, by so far north as the Arctic. I mean, it is fairly it's sort of 20 degrees north and south of there. Um, but as you get more melting, you are increasing the salinity. And I talked about this thermohaline circulation. And that deep circulation is part of what moves heat around this globe. And it's one reason why Europe is warmer at the same latitude than North America, because you have the Gulf Stream carrying that heat up there. And that's sort of the flip side of thermohaline circulation. So as you have more fresh water coming into the North Atlantic from this melting ice, there's an 
a concern that that may decrease the sinking of that water down at the beginning of the thermohaline circulation and that that might then weaken the other currents that are associated with it. So, you know, sort of connect the dots, you might weaken the Gulf Stream, which brings heat to Europe because you have more melting of ice in the Arctic. So those connections are really being actively looked at. I mean, that's an active area of research, not of my own, but of others, because there are these expected or, or um, likely connections between the currents and the physics. Definitely, it's a really good question. Anyone else? That's pretty long, so yeah. Okay. All right. Thank I'm you. Okay. Oh. Oh. Well, obviously, I want to thank Ben for a really informative talk. I thought he was going to tell us why penguins never evolved in the Arctic, and I, I've always wondered that, <laughs> even from the age of five. Anyway, leaving that aside, I think that you know what we've seen this evening is how the power of international scientific collaboration, harnessing the uh, resources that we have, tackling really quite a big problem that we all know is current, but we don't really understand the implications of. And I think that by the way Ben has explained it, we're starting to gain some insights in why the Arctic really does matter. And for those of you who might have missed it, of course, Maine is ho hosting the Arctic Council here in October, based in Portland. There'll be a whole range of events. Some of them are public events. Uh, we'll help to get that word out, with, out to people, as will many institutions across Maine. So this is the year to be proud of Maine's contribution to what's happening in the Arctic and the work of Ben and his other colleagues here in Bigelow and all around the world. So thanks very much indeed, Ben. Yep.